All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's virtual event, Family Finance, Create Your Legacy, presented by David Handler of Kirkland & Ellis and in partnership with Zach Mangles of Private Ocean. Kirkland & Ellis is one of the world's most elite law firms, recognized for their exceptional service to clients in private equity, M&A, and other complex corporate transactions, while also maintaining a resolute commitment to pursuing justice to help foster a more equitable and inclusive world. Private Ocean is a wealth management, financial planning, and retirement planning firm deliberately structured to give clients the intimate experience of a small firm while harnessing the power, depth, and discipline of a much larger one. We are so glad that you both are here. A big thank you as well to our supporting sponsor, Lyric Opera Wine Auction. Please check out their expo booth and learn more about this amazing event that allows guests to actively make an investment in Lyric's future while enjoying the thrill of the world's finest wines and once in a lifetime luxury travel and dining experiences. We are also joined today by Susan Noyes, founder and publisher of Make It By Media Group. Susan will be introducing the speakers and facilitating the Q&A portion of our presentation. My name is Natasha. I am the marketing manager here and virtual events coordinator at Make It Better Media. And I will be the woman behind the curtains helping to moderate today's event. If you have any technical questions, please feel free to reach out to me via the chat located on the right side of your screen. The stage chat feature is also where you can submit your questions for the Q&A portion of our event. We are excited to hear from you. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Susan who will introduce David. Thank you so much, Natasha. And thank you also, David and Zach, for taking the time for this presentation. And most of all, thank you to the audience, about 200 people who have joined us for this. It is my pleasure to introduce David Handler. He heads the Trust and Estates Practice Group of Kirkland and Ellis, and he is a fellow at the American College of Trust and Estate Council. He's also a member of the NAEPC Estate Planning, Hall of Fame and is an accredited estate planner, the Chicago Estate Planning Council, and on and on. He is, in short, not only is Kirkland & Ellis an elite law firm, David is one of the most elite estate planners in the country. We're very honored to have him here today. Oh, David, you're on mute. Uh, thank you. <laughs> that would have been a mistake. So thank you for that introduction. Um, and Susan, I can't, sorry, I can't be with you on the West Coast where it's a little bit warmer than here in Chicago. Uh, but uh, glad to be here. And um, we've got a lot to cover, so I, I'm gonna jump right in. I'm gonna be talking you know, at a fairly high level on, on wealth transfers and, and estate planning in general. But right now is, and, and I don't say this lightly, You know, I'm not one who says the sky is falling or you gotta do this today, you gotta do this now. But truly right now is a time to be re revisiting estate plans. And that's for a few reasons. One, uh, the economy is very different um, and the markets are very different from where they were just a year, two, three years ago. So numbers have changed, wealth has changed significantly in many areas and that can have a big impact on estate plans and wealth transfers and what might someone might want to do. We're also in an era of uh, historically low interest rates and many of the estate planning strategies that I'll, I'll mention um, rely on uh, beating an interest rate and when the interest rate is very low it's easier to transfer wealth and some of those rates in the past have been six seven eight percent and the rates that we're looking at right now are in the one percent range uh, e even lower depending on, on the type of structure and so uh, it, it's an opportune time for these things and third we have um, extremely high gift tax exemptions as you may know the gift tax exemption right now and the state tax exemption which are really the same thing is 11.7 million dollars per person so a husband and wife can each leave for example 11.7 million dollars combined to their children without any estate tax at least at the federal level um, that exemption may change uh, and that's always been true, but number one, it's scheduled to go down in half in 2026 under the current law. And number two, the Biden administration is talking, uh, and not just talking, in earnest about reducing that exemption sooner. 
And so using that exemption uh, before it is reduced can, can beat the clock. Giving away $11 million today before the exemption is lowered to say $5 million can get an extra $6 million out of the estate. Um, many of my clients ask, do you think it's going to be retroactive if they put that in place? I don't have a crystal ball, and anyone that says they do don't don't believe them. But uh, I doubt it would be retroactive. But one never knows when that law would go into play. Um, so for all those reasons, this is a time to revisit estate plans. What do the plans say? What are the uh, what are the bequests? What are the dollars involved? But also uh, revisiting wealth transfers uh, for all these reasons uh, is really an opportune time. And I've been urging my clients. One client pointed out to me last year, I sent an email to, to probably 50, 60 clients that I thought it would be of interest. You know, the markets, interest rates were very low last March, as they are now. And the markets, actually, it was March 18th. Today is March 18th. Um, this is to the day. You can check this. But last March 18th was the market low. Uh, I, actually, I happened to send an email to clients saying you might want to consider wealth transfers right now because the markets are down. And if they rebound, it would be it would be a, a great uh, wealth transfer. And one of them emailed me a month later saying, you know, you called the market low. So I didn't realize it was today uh, to the day. Um, but let's talk about wealth transfers, some of the things you might look at. So as I mentioned, there's the high gift exemptions. And one thing you need to know is if, if we just call it $11 million and if the exemption goes down to five, if you give away $5 million today and they lower the exemption down to five, you didn't beat the clock. The only way to give away, to get more out of the estate while the exemption is high is to give more than it is lower to. Because if you gave away five today and they lower it to five in a month or in a year, then you will have a $5 million exemption and you will have used your $5 million exemption. So the only way to beat it is to go north of $5 million, give away six, seven, eight, nine, or even the 11, full $11 million. There are a number of ways to do that. You know, typically, we would set up trusts. Um, with many of our clients, we're setting up a trust. So a husband, for example, sets up a trust for wife and children. The client says, look, I'm willing to give away $11 million. I think I can part with it. But by including his spouse as a beneficiary, there is this trap door uh, to get the assets back. And I always caution clients, don't give away assets that are going to cause you to lose sleep. For example, if the spouse dies or they divorce, those assets are not coming back. So be prepared to have parted with those assets. But you can do the basic math, giving away $11 million, million today, growing that at 5% for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. It becomes a pretty massive number, let alone doubling that number. So use of high exemptions while you're able and willing. Um, then taking advantage of low interest rates. So there's a number of ways to do that. Uh, the simplest way is uh, typically, again, with the trust, I can make a loan to a trust for my kids. And if it's what's called a grantor trust, there, there's no interest uh, income imputed, uh, no interest income that I have to report on a tax return. So I could lend $20 million to a trust for my children and take back a $20 million promissory note bearing interest at 1% right now. And so if they invest those funds and make 2%, 3, 5, 8, 10, they get all of that money. All the growth is out of my estate. So what I've done is I've frozen my estate at that 20 million mark for that piece. And it's going to grow at only 1%. And if the assets grow at anything higher than that, that's out of my estate that belongs to my kids or belongs to their trust. So you can see the benefit of these low interest rates. When rates are 5 or 6%, that's a very different wealth transfer. If you, earn, if you have a 6% hurdle and you make 8, yeah, 2% is nice. Um, but one, you have to make the eight in the first place. But second, it, when it's only 1%, it's a lot easier to beat it. And the math is, is much, much better. So high gift exemptions, low interest rates. Um, there's also the ability to take advantage of valuation discounts. Um, and the IRS has proposed some regulations back in 2016 that would have, they were trying to eliminate them. Uh, they withdrew those because they were frankly unworkable and unclear and there were many hearings about them and finally they just pulled it back. But valuation discounts come into play. For example, uh, you have a, a family business and the business is worth fifty million dollars and you say I want to transfer ten percent. You and I would say that's worth five million dollars, ten percent of fifty. 
But because this is a minority interest, this is 10% of a closely held business. You can't easily sell the stock. It's a minority vote. Um, someone would not pay you $10 million for 10%. They might pay you seven, maybe even six. And so for gift tax purposes, you could transfer it at six or seven million, even though if the company was sold, it would turn into 10. So taking advantage of low rates, gift exemptions, valuation discounts um, are all very powerful. Um, I mentioned trusts. So typically uh, when our clients are trying to transfer wealth and continue to do so, we use what are called grantor trusts. A grantor trust is one that because of the terms that we build into it and rules in the tax code, the income and gains are taxable to the grantor. So if I set up a trust for my kids as a grantor trust, if it has $100,000 of income or gains, that goes on my tax return. I pay the taxes. That is a wealth transfer because if the alternative was they pay the taxes. So my payment of taxes is a benefit to my children and it's not considered a taxable gift. And you can uh, imagine how these can be pretty significant. You know, put in much, much larger numbers, much, much larger gains. You're letting the trust grow for the kids on a tax-free basis and reducing the grantor's estate by the taxes they're paying. We're always careful though, whenever you set one of these up, make sure there's an escape clause, make sure that there's a way to turn off grant or trust status so you don't, you don't get bankrupted, honestly. Um, I've had clients where they've, the trusts have grown so big over time, they were paying five, six million dollars a year or more of taxes for their kids. In some cases, they're able to do so and it, and it saved a lot of estate tax. In other cases, they, they said, please stop, we, we need to end this, um, and, and we've done that. So grants or trusts, truly, once you've built up a sizable trust, that is actually the most powerful wealth transfer. Um, and it, it doesn't require any fancy uh, acrobatics like sales and, and notes and, and the like. Um, there's a transaction also known as a GRAT. It stands for Grantor Retained Annuity Trust. And if you Google that, you'll find lots of articles about it. It's another way of using leverage. Um, so I transfer $10 million of stock to this GRAT. This, it's sort of an intermediate trust. And if it beats the IRS interest rate, right now also about 0.8% uh, or 1%, um, the excess goes to my kids. So just like the note, uh, but with a GRAT, um, it has a distinct advantage of my kids don't have the downside. So if the stocks actually go down, I get them back. If they go up, they get the winning hands. So it's something else to put on the list if you're talking with your estate planning counsel. Um, two other points I just want to make because we've got to uh, pass along to Zach. So trust design. Um, it's easy to talk about we should have a grad, we should have a grantor trust, we should make gifts, set up a trust for the kids. The quote, trust for the kids, needs to have some focus. These are not, uh, these are not commodities. Uh, there are very big differences in trusts in terms of the flexibility that they have, what can be changed, what cannot be changed. Um, there's lot, if you think of these trusts, they, these trusts may last for decades, maybe generations. So flexibility is, is key. We don't know what next year holds, let alone what 20 years hold, let alone what 50 or 100 years hold for our children, for our grandchildren, great-grandchildren. What is the world going to look like? Are trusts going to be good? Are they going to be bad? Um, so design of those trusts is imperative and having a well-designed, well-thought-out trust with as much flexibility as you can have uh, is imperative. Um, last thing I want to mention is charity. Um, you know, Zach's going to talk about this a little bit as well, but charity is always a consideration in my estate plans. I always raise the issue with my clients. It's up to them if they want to leave money to charity. Most often they do. Um, but sometimes, you know, the initial thought is, okay, I'm going to leave everything to my spouse and then to my kids. It's only when I remind them, hey, you've been giving so much to charity all these years. Do you want to leave something when you pass away? That they then say, oh, you're right. I, I do want to do so. Um, and and they're, they're sort of what I call the nirvana of estate plans. And that is you do enough wealth transfers during your lifetime that you've moved enough to your children and grandchildren that in, in your mind, they have enough. Whatever enough is, there's a huge range of, of numbers on that. Um, but once you've ach achieved that, then the estate plan can be revised to say everything goes to the surviving spouse and then to a family foundation. Then there's no estate tax whatsoever. Um, so I have many clients that have, have reached that point. Others, you know, they keep raising the number for their kids, which is fine. And last point I want to make on charity is 
think about the cost. What is the cost of leaving money to charity versus your kids? Let's take a million dollars. If and let's assume that million dollars would be subject to a state tax if we left it to the kids, if we used exemptions. So if I leave that to my three kids, federal and state, at least in Illinois, uh, combined a state tax about 50%. So a million becomes 500,000. Then we divide it by three, so they get 166,000 apiece. Not bad, but we started with a million. I could have left that million dollars to a family foundation or a donor advised fund and or a charity for that matter, any a direct charity for that matter. Um, and so the million dollars goes to a charity or my kids each get an extra $166,000. There's usually a point my clients reach of diminishing returns. Yeah, the extra 166 isn't going to make a difference for my kids. A million dollars to charity is going to be meaningful. And so I just raised that is with all my clients of, you know, what are your objectives and perhaps this fits in. Um, so I'm going to hand it off uh, to, to Zach. Of course, to Susan. Well, David, thank you so much. I have about four questions that I want to follow up with you on based on that excellent uh, presentation. Great. But now it's Zach's turn. Zach Mangles is a financial advisor and principal at Private Ocean Wealth Management, specializing in retirement planning, education planning, and estate planning. He has a master's degree in financial planning and is a certified financial planner. His firm manages over $2 billion for all high net wealth in individuals. Intriguingly, he's also the father of uh, a married daughter living in the city of San Francisco and a two and a half year old daughter. So his expertise in all those areas and his life experience match the ability to provide very full circle advice. Zach, looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Susan, and um, welcome to everybody who tuned in to this discussion today. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to use my time to talk about two topics. The first is um, the first is how to approach defining your legacy and actually validate that your legacy goals are feasible. And then the second one is to review some of the common estate and legacy planning techniques that I find myself talking about most frequently with clients and I think that's because they apply to a very wide range of people. So uh, let's start off with an approach for defining your legacy. Um, broadly speaking, there's three buckets to consider. You've got the bucket for heirs, for charity, and then for taxes. Um, when I first start having these conversations with clients, we talk about it in percentage terms. Everybody says, you know, 0% to taxes, and then some mixture of percentages between their heirs and charity. Percentages are a great place to start, but thinking about dollars is can be much more impactful. Because if you think about giving 50% of your estate to your children, that sounds a lot different than my 22-year-old child inheriting $6 million if I were to pass away tomorrow. That sort of sharpens the decision-making when you consider it from a dollar perspective. So I think that that exercise is important to do. And the real real critical thing to consider as you're going through this entire exercise is understanding the why, what's so important about these specific gifts to you. Getting to the root of that um, helps you prioritize these legacy goals with all of the other goals that are part of your financial life, like when you retire, um, at what age you want to be work optional, whether you upgrade or downgrade your home at a certain point in the future. Um, so let me talk about uh, some additional parameters, um, um, you know, how you might refine the amounts that are within the buckets. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about, I'll share some stories about how you can pass on values with wealth. That was one of the, that was part of the subtitle of this talk. And I thought that was really interesting because a lot of people don't consider passing on their values as necessarily a part of their legacy. So the first parameter to think about is, um, are you giving during lifetime or at death? A lot of people think about creating their legacy as this thing that happens after you pass away. But as we heard from David, it can also be things that you can be, you can put into place now. Um, and so as an example of that, one of my clients really believes in the value of education. It's how they created the success in their lives. And they wanted to ensure that that value of education and that experience of education gets passed on to their children and grandchildren. And of course, 
in order for that to happen, they can't really wait until they pass away because their kids are going to grow up and their grandkids are going to go up. So we work together to figure out a comfortable amount for them that they could support their grandchildren with. And what's been really amazing is that they're actually able to see the impact that this is having on their grandchildren's lives via uh, the successful and um, uh, rewarding careers that they all have. Um, the second parameter is going to be time versus money. And a lot of people, again, will think about legacy as it relates to giving assets away. But time is also a really important thing to consider, especially as it relates to philanthropy. Um, and what I found, and if any of you out there have done this as well, um, time can be a really significant contribution that can ultimately be more valuable than money, especially if you're leveraging the expertise that you've developed in your career to help further these charitable causes. So I'll talk, uh, I'll share a story about how you might pass on uh, the value of giving to your heirs while also um, contributing money to charity as, as an example. Um, one of my clients gives meaningfully to charity each year. And um, yeah, he gives individually, uh, he gives meaningfully to charity each year. And um, uh, what they, what he wants to do is he really wants to make sure that they can pass on that value of giving to their children, especially because their children are gonna inherit a meaningful amount of wealth. So what they do is they actually involve their kids in this annual charitable process. And um, their kids have been doing this now for about 10 years. So they're teens now, and they're, they're really into this. And they actually have causes of their own that they really, that, they, that they're passionate about. And so as a family, they decide every year how much to give away and um, you know, to who they're gonna give it to. And, and it can be, that's a pretty powerful thing to do for your kids. Last element I'll talk about is the idea of giving money versus giving personal property. Um, I think often personal property has much more significance in the eyes of your heirs rather than, you know, inheriting an account. It's the objects that we grew up with or that our parents or grandparents have that are that can ultimately be more important. So considering how you pass on those assets, those that, that personal property is an important thing to take into account as you're creating your legacy. And I'll share a personal story about how that happened in my life. Uh, my mom passed away when I was 19, and she had a number, she had uh, some jewelry that she felt it was really important to give to me and my brother. And for each of these items of jewelry, she wrote a story that went along with it. And the story basically was, talked about how she received the, the jewelry, why it was important to her, and um, why she was giving it to us. So I received this uh, men's ring with a Z on it, Z for my name. Um, but also Z for Zanesville, which was the town that she grew up in and where her family is from. And so as part of this letter to me at the bottom, it said, Zach, this is so that you, this is a reminder to always remember your roots. And so here I am almost 20 years later, still thinking about that, sharing that as a story with you guys. And so that's an example of how um, values can be passed on through passing on personal property. I've seen clients also do this if, if they're if they're not going down that route. There's a there's a um, a document called an ethical will, and you can use an ethical will to to uh, document your your history, to document the things that are most important to you, your values, what you want to share special stories you want to share. And then also where I think this works especially well is what you want your children to get out of their inheritance and how, how you hope that they spend it. It doesn't have the force of law behind it, but you're communicating your wishes and your desires. So we've talked a little bit about the who, the what, the when, the why of defining your legacy. Now what you need to do is actually see if this ideal vision of your legacy is doable with the assets that you have. So we got to figure out what's actually possible. And this is where the financial plan itself comes in. And the first step of any financial plan is ensuring that your needs are met and that your primary financial goals are achievable. So once you've done that exercise, then you layer on your legacy goals and you quantify what you can comfortably give away during your life and how much would be left over at death. Um, if there's any excess, that's great. You get to dream bigger. You can create a larger legacy. 
um, or, or you can optimize or, or um, strengthen other goals that you might have. Um, if it doesn't quite work, if all your legacy goals don't quite fit, well, then that's where you work to understand where the trade-offs exist. And if legacy goal X and Y are of critical importance to you and you want to make sure that happens. So, for example, you want to make sure each of your children inherit $2 million when you pass away. Well, then you might need to give up a little on retirement goal A and B. The next step would then be working with your whole financial team. This is where your estate attorney, this is where your accountant, your financial advisor are ideally working together with each other. And as your estate attorney and your accountant are talking about strategies and tactics, um, I think you we, we heard David talk about how there can be lots of complexity involved. You can also end up giving up control over your assets and why it's important to have an escape clause. Um, but all of these things, um, what, they could end up adjusting or augmenting the financial path that you're on. So it's really important that as you're exploring these ideas, that it, feed back, that it feeds back into the financial plan and so that you can ensure that you're still on a safe and sustainable trajectory. So that's a little bit about defining your legacy. Um, I wanna move to the other end of the spectrum now and talk about some strategies uh, that I find myself discussing with clients and prospective clients pretty frequently. And I'm intentionally gonna touch on both ends of this spectrum to give those of you who don't work with the financial planner a sense of the scope of the conversations um, that at least we're having with clients at Private Ocean. So the first thing I'll talk about is highly appreciated stock. And we're gonna touch on this from two perspectives as a gift to charity and a gift to your heirs. So if you imagine that you had stock that you, you know, bought for $1,000 and it's worth $10,000 now, just to pick up some numbers here, there's a great, there's a pretty large degree of appreciation. And now let's imagine that you want to make a $10,000 gift to charity. And this is the asset that you're going to use for that. Typically what people will do is they'll sell the asset they have, they get the $10,000 of cash, they give it to charity and the charity gets the full use of it. What's happened to the person? Well, they've created a capital gains tax liability for themselves, and they get a, a bit of a tax deduction to help offset that. Alternatively, instead of selling the stock itself, you could just gift it directly to the charity. And because charities are tax exempt entities, when they go and sell that $10,000 stock, they're not gonna pay any capital gains for it. So what's that look like to you? Well, you get to permanently avoid that capital gains tax because you've given it away. You've had the charities deal with it for you, but you still get to receive a, a charitable deduction for it. So you've minimized tax slippage there, the amount that goes to taxes in that whole process and still given the gift to charity and still gotten the tax benefit. The other way that this can work with heirs is if you are in a very high tax bracket, and your heirs are in a low, lower one. And this is something that you would do during your lifetime. So imagine again, you have the, your 22 year old children uh, and you're helping to support them financially. You are selling from your investments and giving them the resulting cash. Again, you're gonna be, as a result of that liquidation, you're paying capital gains tax at a very high rate. What you could do alternatively is you could gift the stock to your children and then let them sell it at their presumably much lower rates. So there's still some tax slippage. Money still does go out to taxes, but looking across the whole family unit, it's gonna be a lot less. The other item that I find myself talking about is this idea of annual gifting. So David had talked about the lifetime gift and estate tax exemption uh, around $11 million. There's another one that rides below that, and that's the annual gift amount. And that's this year, it's 15,000, it changes. And I can give $15,000 to anybody. I can give 15,000 to all of you out there. And that does not at all eat into my lifetime gift exemption. Now, what's really interesting is my wife and I together, we can double up and we can give $30,000 to all of you that are out there. And again, it doesn't create any tax liability for ourselves. Where this can get really interesting is, let's say you have two kids and four grandkids. So six total, you're gonna to give $30,000 to all of them or about $180,000. I can give 180 on December 31st, another 180 on January 1st. I've now given almost $400,000 from my estate over to my heirs 
and I have not created any tax liability for myself and I have not used any of my lifetime gift and estate tax exemption. So you can see that that can be a pretty powerful thing to be doing during your lifetime and on an annual basis. Check the time here, okay. Uh, one other thing you can do with the annual gifting that I think is interesting when it relates to education planning. Uh, 529 accounts are fantastic accounts to save for college. And what those accounts allow you to do is actually give five times the annual gift exemption in one shot. So a married couple, let's say uh, grandparents could help fund the education for their children. They can put 150 grand at one time inside of a 529 account. Last thing I wanna talk about is the idea that there are some accounts that are better suited for charities to receive and other accounts that are better suited for individuals to receive. We talked about already how charities are tax exempt. Um, qualified retirement plans, pre-tax, traditional, different names for them, but we're talking about an IRA, we're talking about a 401k. If your heirs inherit those, there can be a tax liability to them when they take the withdrawal from it, just like when you would take your own withdrawal from it. Now, if instead of allocating your retirement accounts, your pre-tax retirement accounts to your heirs, if you instead allocated that to charity, well, when they take withdrawals, they're not paying the taxes on that side. So you've eliminated that tax element. You basically moved it from the tax bucket that it could go into and given that all to charity. What would you then give, how would you, what would you prioritize for your own heirs? Um, Roth accounts, that stuff comes out tax, to, tax free. Um, regular taxable accounts, um, real estate, those, those assets typically get something called a step up in basis that eliminates the embedded capital gains. Um, and so when they receive it, they don't pay uh, at least the same amount of taxes that you might have otherwise paid on it. So those are three different strategies that I think apply to a lot of people out there. And I hope that in this talk, you've heard a few that have resonated with you. Most importantly, though, after listening to David and me talk, it's that you get a sense of the wide variety of options and the complexity that can be involved uh, in creating your legacy, and that you see the importance of working with your whole financial team to both strategize and implement it. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zach. And I love that you just brought, you started with values and then you brought in family. And that's exactly where I'd like to start with a question. Um, and we welcome any questions from the audience too. Uh, the, when, when is the right time to start talking to your children about wealth? And what are the right conversations to have along the way that make sure that parents are able to share their values? how the wealth was created, et cetera. Mm. Um, can I start, I'll start off with this one. Um, there is no one size fits all answer for this. Um, and it is really gonna depend on who your children are as people and who they are shaping up to become going forward in time. Um, I think that starting to, especially when you're dealing with meaningfully sized estates, I think if you believe that your children can handle it, uh, it's my opinion that starting to involve them, uh, not necessarily in the details, but in the decision making and the, the things that go into financial planning and financial maneuvering, I think involving them earlier can be better. You give them a chance to acclimate. And I really let that example that I gave of my client who involves his children in philanthropy, you know, their ch his children don't know the full scope of the estate. All they know is this piece uh, that they're allocating to charity. And so if you're able to do it in a way where you're slowly bringing them in over time and as they're demonstrating maturity, you, 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 you let them in further and further, I think that can be a great way to go about it. But at the end of the day, it's always gonna be situationally dependent. Yeah, completely agree. And just to add to that is um, I tell my clients, your children are not oblivious. They see where they live, how you live, how you travel. The very fact that you have a family foundation is indicative of wealth. So they're not oblivious. And also, if you're concerned about them knowing the full extent of the wealth, which is a legitimate concern, if 
you know, if your net worth is a hundred million, but your kids think you have 10, 10 is a billion dollars to an 18 year old. It might as well be a hundred million dollars to them. It's wow. There's unlimited funds here. So, um, just keep all that in mind that they're not in the dark nearly as much as anyone might imagine. Um, but I completely agree with, with Zach. There is no one size fits all and earlier is better. Um, when, when, when they can handle it. And David, you just referenced the family foundation. When is the right time to set up a family foundation and what would alternatives to that be? If you particularly want to have conversations around philanthropy and, you know, your charitable values with them. Right. So, most of my clients that call me and say, I want to set up a foundation, end up without one. Because I'll always ask them, why do you think you want a foundation? What does the foundation mean to you when you just called me up? You know, what did you read or what did you hear? Um, and, and uh, you know, so the foundation is for, you know, if the answer that they give me is, I don't know, we just give money to charity. Here's the five charities we support every year. We're going to continue doing that then I say, why not continue doing that? Why might make things more complicated? On the other hand, a, a foundation or a donor advised fund, which is often a good alternative, you know, it's a good way, if you want to, if you have a large gain one year and we want to take a large deduction one year and then dole it out to charities over time, that's where foundation donor advised fund can come in. Um, and donor advised fund, I, I think the comparison there is a family foundation is a bespoke, you know, your own entity, you formed it, you comprise the board, your family, others, you, you're the officers, directors, you manage everything. Um, and so that's like, you know, call it the family business, um, or you have your personal private investment manager that works only for your family. And then over here is a donor advised fund, which is sort of like the mutual fund equivalent of that. I don't need to hire my own financial asset manager. There's a mutual fund that's already doing all that work. A donor advised fund is a form of public charity. I give them the money and it goes in an account and I have a lot of room to manage it and make decisions on investments. And when I want to send money to a charity, I call them up or go online and tell them to send money to a charity. And so it accomplishes a lot of the same things as a, as a family foundation. Um, but maybe uh, the family foundation is, so when do you do a foundation? When does the client get to that? Um, one, maybe just the dollars that's involved. Two, it might be what they're trying to give away is not something a charity wants. You know, it might be closely held assets, for, for example. Um, three, maybe they want to um, get involved, not just writing checks to charities, but actually running a, a homeless shelter or running a scholarship program. So you can't do those through the donor advised fund. Um, and then last is sometimes they just want to have a, a real entity owned, so to speak, by the family, just more concrete, get the kids more heavily involved. It's not just this donor advised fund. This is our entity. You're actually on the board. You have a, you have a job here to oversee these funds. You're a steward and we need to figure out which charities, uh, we think are ones that we want to support. Thank you so much. Can I point out, we have a wonderful question from the audience from Barbara. If you inherit an IRA or 401k, is there a requirement to take the distributions over 10 years? There is now. Um, and there can there are some exceptions. So if you're a spouse inheriting an IRA or a 401k, it's sort of the old rules. You take it over as if it's your own and you can get lifetime distribution over it. But basically speaking, if you're a non-spouse inheriting a retirement account in this post-Secure Act world, Secure Act, that was the one, David, that created the tenure. Right. Um, if you're inheriting something in this post-Secure world and you're not a spouse, you're looking at at most a 10-year distribution window. There's some technicalities there. If you inherit it and you're under 18, it can stretch out a little bit longer. But for ease of remembrance, 10 years. Can you can you explain why people might want to stretch it out rather than just take it all at once? Yeah, that's a tax game, an income tax game. If I have a million dollars, a million dollar IRA, if I spread it out over ten years, I can pay taxes on a hundred thousand dollars every year, uh, and hopefully that keeps you under some you know larger income tax bracket. If I take all that million out at once, 
you are in the top marginal tax bracket there and you're going to you're going to lose a lot more money to taxation that way makes sense thank you um we are really honored to have the lyric opera of chicago wine auction uh sponsoring this and the lyric opera is a terrific example of a cultural institution that's been hit hard during the pandemic uh so could you talk a little bit about giving to an institution like the Lyric Opera in a thoughtful manner during this really difficult time versus through your estate plan? Sure, I'll chime in first. Um, we've had, and, and this has been heartwarming, I have to say, during this last year, seeing my clients really step up to the plate because uh, I had so many calls about charitable giving whether it's direct gifts or foundations or donor advised funds, but really trying to, you know, the need is current and how do we, how do we do that now? And, and by the way, the IRS uh, was very fast in approving foundation applications last year, faster than I've ever seen. And I think for that reason to get money out to those in need. And um, so, you know, to help those in need, you can write a check or as Zach suggested, you can transfer stock publicly traded stock that they can immediately sell. You avoid the gain. They've got the cash. It's in their hands. They can use it now, you know, for their purposes. Um, I and mean, there's other things, you know, when you say, you know, alternatives are part of the estate plan. So when I'm gone, but you know, that's hopefully a hundred years from now. So it's not helping the cause today. Um, and, and actually one other way is if you already have your family foundation or donor advised fund, pushing that money out, you already gave it away. It's going to charity one time or another. And so, uh, you know, looking to those in need today that need to keep the lights on, uh, literally uh, to keep the lights on in these times. Um, we've seen a lot of that uh, activity happening in the last year. And I think this one's for David too. Um, it's from Stephen. What is the Illinois state limit amount? Um, so Illinois doesn't really have one. So Illinois has what I'll call a cliff. So if your estate is, first of all, anything you leave, at death to surviving spouse or charity, there's no tax. Um, if your estate is four million dollars or less, be, uh, of amount going to children, you know, not to spouse or charity, then there's no tax. If it's four million and one going to your kids, then the entire four million and one is subject to Illinois tax. So it's once you're over it, you're over it, and there is no exemption. Um, and uh, so typically, the estate plan can be structured to get at least $4 million at the first spouse's death into a trust free of federal and state taxes. And then at the second spouse's death, if everything else is going to the kids, there will be tax on the balance. Uh, but unfortunately there is no exemption currently in Illinois. It's, it's like I said, it's a cliff. And what about California? I've always heard, you know, it's an expensive thing tax wise to live in California, but it's a great place to die. Is that still true? <laughs> That's true. There is no state tax in California. And it's very expensive to live here. <laughs> Let me actually, if I could just go back one more, one second to the question you asked about, you know, how can you give to charity today? Um, I just want to talk about one other technique that you can use, uh, and that's with retirement plans. You've got to be over 70 and a half to do this, but these are called qualified charitable distributions, QCDs. Um, effectively, what you're able to do is you're able to direct part of your annual well, it doesn't have to be part of the required minimum distribution. You're basically able to take a distribution from your IRA or 401k and you give that directly to charity. You don't pay any income taxes on it. And one of the things that's nice about it, if you're familiar with how taxes work, because it's not hitting your, um, your top level income, it's lowering all of the thresholds for your other itemized deductions and deductions and credits and phase outs that you may be taking elsewhere. So that's another way that you can give when you are taking mandatory distributions, you can direct that portion of it directly to charity. So for a lot of the clients I work with who don't actually need to spend their own RMDs, required distributions every year, um, we're working with them to direct that directly to the charities that they care about. But one, uh, one thing every client asks, can I send it to my private foundation or my donor advised fund? And the answer for that rule is no, it's gotta go to a public charity into their hands direct yeah so there's another good great question that i don't actually even understand when giving to multiple beneficiaries what is the difference between fair and equal hmm. 
uh, fair is what you tell your children. Life isn't always fair. <laughs> and your brother deserves more than you <laughs> because they take out the garbage and you don't, or they have worked harder than you. Um, or yeah, equal is equal. And many, I'd say most of my clients believe in equal regardless of circumstances. And others make adjustments because one of their kids is a CEO and has millions of his own money. And the other one is a school teacher working just as hard, but has a quarter of the assets, if that. And I'm just going to leave more to this child or someone with a disability or anything like that. So equal, you know, fair in their, in their mind, that's being fair. Um, I tell my clients, I encourage them, if you're going to do that, you know, keep peace in the family, give your kids a heads up, tell the wealthy one, they're not getting as much. Um, here, they're, they may say, that's fine, I'm good, glad for my brother or sister to have it. In other cases, you want to know if they're going to, you know, cause a ruckus and, and file a suit or something beforehand and, and tighten things up. I, I sometimes see a lot of hand wringing from clients when they're considering the not going the equal route, but going more of the fair route. And, and I tell them the same thing, which is, you know, have the conversation. You know, they're typically they don't want to have that conversation because they're worried about what it'll lead to. But in not having it and in letting their children just see how the estate plays out that can be much more detrimental long term. So I always think it's important to just open up those lines of communication. And as we were saying earlier, to do it early. It's all about communication, communication, communication. And that's where communication of values comes in too. So learning to become, to sort of get over that discomfort and then having the honest conversations makes a big difference, I would think. Do you recommend uh any kind of mm, facilitator or mediator uh for those kind of conversations if you think it's going to be difficult um there there's an industry so to speak of people that do that that help uh clients convey values both financial and non-financial and expectations um usually i usually see those in you know larger families you know there's the extended family and the grandparents are still here and they're going to leave everything and it's in trust and um, trying to convey those things. Or if there's some dysfunction uh, in the family, most of the time, the vast majority of the time, you know, parents can sit down with their kids and have a conversation. They just need to be prepared of what they, I, I've been asked to participate in some of these. And my question beforehand is always, what is it that you want me to say? And more importantly, what is it that you don't want me to say? You know, what information is fair game for this meeting? Um, and I'll tell them, you know, you're going to get these, I'm going to get these questions. I'm going to say something and then say, well, how much is in my trust? And you need to be, have an answer, whether that's, we're not going to tell you right now, or here's a number, or it's north of a million dollars, you know, pick a number, some, you know, it's more than X. That's all you need right now. But you need to be prepared. You know, if the kids are going to ask their questions, anyone would ask. So one, it's almost not fair, but it's something that I think about all the time. What is the ideal, well-organized estate plan look like? The one that's the simplest to uh, pass on and you can die with no worries whatsoever. <laughs> uh, the latter part doesn't exist, no worries whatsoever. But um, the really having the right team, as Zach said, is the most important because, you know, I've had clients that say, I want to have a book of everything. The book is always changing and the account statements and the assets and the documents and everything else. So if you have a good team, the lawyer is going to have all the documents and that that's typically wills, revocable trusts, powers of attorney at a minimum. Um, and then irrevocable trust for lifetime gifting foundation documents, if there is one, but the whole suite, if there's a family partnership, obviously the partnership agreements, but what goes, those are just, those are just vessels. Zach's the one who we need on the team who knows where the assets are. He knows where the bodies are buried. He knows <laughs> what there is. Uh, and then we need the CPA on the team because they know the tax basis and the attributes of all these things and what's got gain and what does not, and what bucket do we want each one in? And so it is this, this team approach of, uh, of the plan. Um, but you know, it can get to a good place. It's just, remember, just like your investments and anything else, it's not static. 
things change five years later, you need to revisit it if, if not sooner. So that sounds to me like, especially for Zach and Private Ocean, because they like to have in-depth relationships, very personal relationships, it will be important for your clients to make, to introduce their kids to you too, or your, their grandkids. So yeah, that they can know that you can really speak to them as individuals. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, that's, I was going to say, that's one of the really helpful things uh, to, to consider when you want your estate to, to work smoothly. A lot of people think about, as David was saying, just the, the binder of documents, but it's so much more than that. It is introducing your primary heirs to financial advisor, your estate attorney. Um, I think the other important thing is to talk to the people who you intend to name as your successor trustee or who you think will, who you want to hold the powers of attorney for you and let them know you're thinking about naming them um, and, uh, and and get their, get their okay with it. Um, for any of you who've been watching that have been a trustee of an estate or had a power of attorney over somebody, it is basically a part-time job or certainly can be. And it's a lot of effort. So you wanna make sure that the people that you name are comfortable serving that role for you and um, I, I, I'm the successor trustee for several uh, family members of mine, and I, they've actually sent me their full estate plans as well. So I have them on file. So if they do pass away unexpectedly, I'm basically ready to go there. So I would suggest that as another option. One of the things that we do for our clients as well is we keep digital copies of their full estate plan on file for them. And so when they need, they need it to be sent out from time to time, if they're doing a refi or something like that, we have that on file. And then, um, of course, we're always prompting our clients, as David said, you know, every five years, you want to be at the very least thinking about the estate plan, revisiting it, seeing if there's updates. And then as life happens to you, I think about it as if there's a change in the family structure, marriage, divorce, birth, death, those are all um, things that should should clue you into time to go talk to my estate attorney about making an update so that it's always up to date and always ready to go. There is a great conversation going on uh, in the sidebar. It started with this question. How much should an estate, how much should an estate pay a successor trustee or executors? Um, that is more a function of how much, uh, what the assets are and how much there is to manage. Um, you know, if it's a million dollars, 10 million or a hundred million, just like, like in a financial advisor or bank or other institution, they're going to charge a higher amount for a larger dollar amount, but also the nature of the assets. If this is all marketable securities, it's not as much work on, on the part for management. We can hire Zach and he'll take care of it and we'll meet with him quarterly. Um, but if there's a, a, a house to manage and a family farm and a, you know, real estate, rental real estate, whatever there may be, if there's more work involved, then they need to be compensated appropriately. There's some states that have uh, sort of statutory fees, which you can override in your documents, but that's where you'd start. Um, in other places, so if, if a client came to me in Illinois and said, well, how much can I pay my brother-in-law as the trustee? The answer in part is whatever you want, it needs to be a reasonable fee. I think we typically would start at, you know, let's assume sort of a 1% or lower. You know, and so, you know, is this marketable securities and things like that? Maybe it's a, you know, 50 basis points. If there's more going on, maybe it is 1%. If there's real estate and other things to truly manage a business, you know, th then maybe it's higher. Um, but it's somewhere in that in that vicinity. So two, uh, one, one audience member suggested an app that will speak to this to uh, topic. Um, and we will follow up and get that information out to everybody. And then another one asked, how about a child as a trustee of a not very big estate? I'd actually like to ask, how about as a child as the trustee of a very big estate? Uh, so I think that can work. Obviously it depends on your kids and you're not gonna name them unless you trust them and think they're responsible. And I always tell my clients, they don't need to be financial advisors. They don't need to be tax experts because they can hire those people. They need to be responsible and make good decisions. Um, so I think they can be, whether they're the trust. So that's one thing for your trust. Now it's another issue of having one of your kids being the trustee for their siblings and making decisions about distributions to siblings. That's a great way to break up a family, mm -hmm. um, unless they're just gonna keep writing checks. So that's something to 
keep in mind of you know not having siblings overseeing each other's money in effect. Um, to that, and then there's also if it's a trust for my benefit that I inherited, if I'm the trustee, there's certain things that I can do as trustee and beneficiary and still preserve the trust, but there's a limit. Um, so there's certain things that I cannot do and I might need a co-trustee for those things anyway. But it is uh, something we often do. Um, and then I'd say if, if in, in this instance, the let's say it's your, your child is the trustee of your estate and they are the sole and only beneficiary, probably makes sense for them not to take any fees. The attorney, the, the trustee fees are taxable. Uh, when you receive an inheritance, you don't pay any tax on the receipt of it. So, uh, you know, if I'm the, if I'm the trustee and the inheritor of my parents' estate, I'm not going to take any fees at all. I'm just going to let that all come over to me and I'll have more that way. Right. Um, someone recommended a book written by Charles Collier. And I also know that David Handler has written a book. So we need to give a shout out to that. David, can you tell us about your book? Uh, my book may not be that popular with, with this crowd. It's more for the uh, my crowd, that is the attorneys and practitioners. Um, it, it's online only for that matter. It's Walters Kluwer's The uh, Complete Estate Planning Source Book. Uh, it is a, uh, a treatise on estate planning techniques and, and forms. So like I said, it's more for the practitioner but uh, free to look it up on there. Thanks. I'm interested, David. I want to read it. Okay. It's good bedtime reading. <laughs> and the, the, Charles was the head of plan giving at Harvard, Charles Collier. So we should find out, we'll, we'll circulate the name of the app and the name of this book in our follow-up material. Yeah. Is there anything else that you want to make sure that you tell our audience before we say goodbye? Not that I can think of. Uh, I, I think this was great. I think the questions were excellent, actually, um, which I think really makes one of these things stand out. Um, and then the only thing I would say, a, a lot of times clients that I'm talking to have have 90, say 95 percent of their estate plan figured out in their minds. And, you know, maybe they've even had the estate attorney draft all the documents. But there's this just one element that they haven't figured out. It's typically who the successor trustees are going to be. And that will hold them up for sometimes months at a time from getting their estate plan put in place. I always say, don't let perfect be the enemy of good here. Um, having documents that are pretty much exactly what you want in place is infinitely better than having no documents or out of date documents uh, in place instead. And with respect to transfer of wealth now, th there is something that David uh, referenced at the beginning that I want to hit back on G and just use the past year as an example. Imagine uh, owning a tech stock like Apple uh, that has appreciated over the almost doubled in one year's time. Had a grantor annuity trust or the other grantor trusts been used, what would that have meant? Can you just use those numbers sure. as an example? So let's take a grant. If I put $10 million of Apple stock in at $100 a share, um, the grant rules will basically say, it's gonna pay me, so I said 10 million, it'll pay me say 5 million the first year, 5 million the second year, and then it's done. Uh, plus a little bit of interest, the 1% interest. Um, and if the stock stays exactly where it is, I'll just get my own stock back, $10 million worth. But if that stock went from 10 million to 20 million, I'll get 10 million plus 1% of Apple stock back. And then there's another 9.9 .9 million left in this trust that goes free of gift and estate tax to my kids. So uh, that was a phenomenal one. And I can point to a number of clients who have done the Apple stock in the last year, two years, yeah. that's worked out quite well. And that circles back to the, this is the reason why everyone should really think deeply about this right now at this particular moment in time when the tax laws are favorable and the interest rate rates are low. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Natasha, you're back. I'm back. I'm here to close us out because that's all the time we have for today. Um, we're so grateful that you all were able to join us. And thanks again to our wonderful panelists and moderator for making this such a special event.
And a big thank you to everyone that attended and participated in our discussion. Um, we would love to stay connected with you. So if you have not done so already, please subscribe to our Better Letter and follow us on our social media accounts. I'll be sending out a recording of this event soon, along with resources you need to stay connected with us. So just keep an eye on your inbox. It'll be there soon. And then finally, if you're watching this as a recording on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel. We upload new content regularly. And then once again, thank you so much for joining us. And I wish you all a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you. Thanks, David and Zach and Lyric Opera. We hope this helps the wine auction too. Thanks, guys.